Katie Latone. I'm a musician. Um, democratization of music education and islands and islands and beyond. And so I'm going to be talking with uh, providing a few case studies, three case studies I'm going to talk about our um, approaches to the development of curriculum um, with applied music and our uh, commitment to considering um, inclusion, accessibility, and um, our uh, open ethos. So, I'm going to start by talking about um, barriers to creative um, industries as a start. Um, um, it's, we're challenged with, with the creative industries. You can see here that um, the privileged dominate every creative subsector except for graphs. Music, performing, and visual arts, 60%. Those from working class backgrounds are significantly underrepresented. In 20 years, a little over one in four roles in the sector were filled by those with lower socioeconomic backgrounds. This is from the report Social Mobility in the Creative Economy in 2021. And you would require uh, 250,000, I think, it is uh, jobs to, to be able to, uh, or 250 uh, others engaged to be able to. Um, address this um, statistic. So regional educational barriers, I'm sure that uh, you uh, will be aware of now after today, you know, how UHI um, is a tertiary university <laughs> distributed um, and we're, we're looking at that landmass, the size of Belgium. Um, but our um, role with UHI is very much to address um, some of the barriers that we will find. Some of these barriers that I just mentioned, the creative industries, but also um, what the the geographical location, but also migration. Um, with in terms of music, um, traditionally, uh, people wanting to study music would have had to have left the region, and um, so we're very proud of the fact that we've managed to develop a degree in a practical subject which uh, relies uh, on collaboration um, to uh, to enable people to stay in the region. So barriers specific to music education, most music practice is highly collaborative. Um, it requires critical mass to be viable for study and, and investment. And so for us, our classroom is our community. And I'm going to talk more about that. We go and meet with the people, the students, and the communities where where they are uh, with applied music. So, two practices identified in the UHI Open Education Framework um, is we've got open digital and open in the community, and obviously they're very very important to us. Applied music and uh, something that we like to think that we we managed to achieve with applied music is this humanizing the digital and digitizing the community. And you're going to see some examples um, of that. So uh, these, these open education practices are really pillars upon which applied music is curriculum uh, designed. And it's facilitated the development of our core operating values as a degree, which we value very much uh, collaboration over competition. And we value community in all its forms, student, professional, online, local and ultimately centre belonging. I've got some logos here because the, we can demonstrate our impact with the collaborative award and uh, teaching excellence that we received uh, in 2021 and we've had 400% consecutively in the National Student Survey uh, 2018 to 22 and we've been a case study for the Open Learning Create. Um, so we achieved these national student survey 100% even during COVID, which felt, yeah, So our programme features, we have a practical and multi-genre degree, so that's already adding complexity, which if you think about um, gathering uh, students across uh, a wide geography, making it um, multi-genre also adds a degree of uh, complexity, but also absolutely uh, fascinating and interesting and makes it a very creative opportunity 
It's accessible, flexible, students select their own mentor. That's a dual and referring for this uh, degree from the professional community. So we have connections and I manage uh, connecting every student up with somebody that they are inspired by. Whether that's somebody like Carol Pitt-Kay in Los Angeles who did all the bass parts for the Beach Boys recordings. Um, or whether it's somebody in France that a student might be inspired by, or somebody in their local community. So it's uh, very student-centered in that respect. Why have I got a cruise ship there? And that is to demonstrate um, how accessible we've been. We've had a student who was a professional musician in uh, working from the Caribbean, and uh, she dialed in and got a degree um, with us from the Caribbean. Um, we have a diverse student profile from age 17 to 70 um, at the moment. And um, we have school leavers, we have professionals. It makes it a very, very dynamic and rich experience. Blended delivery, you know what that is. Video conference, digital platforms, residencies. I mentioned our community being our resource and students being engaged with their own communities physically wherever they are, as well as online communities. Open approaches ensure students can interpret tasks and repurpose according to their own needs and context. But partnership and collaborative working um, is fundamental to the uh, success of this degree building. Um, oh, I had seem to have um, from in the wrong direction. There we go. Okay, so one of the uh, features of our, our degree program, which is probably the one that we might be best known for, is the development of the virtual residency. Um, we started working in this way in 2014. So when it came to COVID, we were all set for a kind of online collaboration. The, the logos that you can see um, are with some of the partners that we've worked with. What it, what it is, the virtual residency, is it was something that we, uh, the course started in 2012 and we were having residencies four times a year in different locations in Scotland in order to be able to get to our students and to all of our communities and it became quite an undertaking. And so as a way of embedding the digital embedding um, the uh, also the the, able, uh, the accessibility we said okay we're going to create pods we're going to enable you to to either select one of these locations um, and go there or else recently we've actually enabled our students to still work in virtual pods so what we would do is um, we would work on a collaborative creative task uh, over three days which might be something like um, writing music to promote with a film um, or doing a commission uh, we did a commission with community land scotland celebrating 10 years of uh, their organization um, we worked with um, I'll tell you about who else we've worked with, but I wanted to try and understand this diagram. But you can see from the diagram that you've got a list there of the different pods. You've got different pods there, lots of different groups that are working with others. We've even got a group in Switzerland there, a group in Sweden, um, and the, the, the how it works. So complexity, I suppose, is the message there. Um, here we have been working with, for one of the virtual residencies, with um, with uh, universities in Senegal, that QR code takes you to uh, a sample of some of the student work. This was really um, a fascinating experience. It was interdisciplinary. Um, we were working with uh, film students. Our music students were working with film students in Senegal, and as part of this, we were sharing our knowledge came about because we had developed a framework for delivering a uh, virtual residency and we were practiced at it. And there, our partners in Senegal had a similar situation to UHI. Several universities collaborating um, together for departments and uh, distributed. And um, this 
uh, we, we collaborated with, with them to develop anyway this um, residency, interdisciplinary cultural exchange. And um, I thought it was a good one to show because of the student quote. I realized that there was so much we knew and we took for granted, such as the way our way of working, but we also didn't know. And one of the interesting thing for me was the importance of cultural sensitivity and consideration around stereotypes and appropriation. I think that's one of the things that uh, we found very, very valuable for our students. Um, and ethical considerations around cross-cultural collaboration are key values and considerations in our recent pedagogy approach. Um, I'm going to move on to a, another example here. So um, here we have, you recognize the map of Britain, and the, the section in red there are the Outer Hebrides, which are the islands on the west coast of Scotland. Um, there are the Gaelta heartlands, so the, the language is Gaelic, which is spoken by many. Um, and it's the place that I've had the privilege of living for 16 and a half years. Um, and um, it's a place where it's culturally rich, it's linguistically fragile. So um, there's a lot of community um, effort which we've been able to support to, um, to promote the Gaelic language and for the university to be in, involved in that process. So what we would we were asked to do, we were commissioned by the Women's Council um, in, in 2017, I think it was, to, to compose music, no, to arrange music and record music, to research original songs from the area, and to um, to use this is for a Gaelic early early years Gaelic language learning app. Um, so if you, I'll show you a QR code up, and if you can click on it, and you'll see a bunch of an of animations and the music that goes. their songs. The music that goes with it is recorded and arranged by our students. So it's a free, open, <coughs> non-formal because uh, community uh, song and digital recording workshops is what we did um, to create music for this worldwide accessible Gaelic language learning resource. So um, here you can see that again we, we were, this was a really um, uh, rich experience for our students. We're involving young students in the local community but also um, <coughs> older people in the community where we were um, going and um, accessing um, from the oral tradition, we were accessing um, examples of songs that had been almost forgotten. So here we've got the community's classroom and research space. We've got students engaged with professional and local communities. And students themselves and the community are engaged as open content creators and learners. A very rich experience. And one of the students that was involved, in fact, you're going to recognize Jordan in the middle there later um, when we or one uh, another of our students, Chloe Steele, is also very much involved in that, and she's the, the gallant singer who's she's performing later. So um, the impacts, obviously, the impact has, has it's been a very deep learning experience for our students, and obviously assisting with things like employ employability. Um, the Gaelic, um, having Gaelic as part of your repertoire and understanding, um, is very important for. Uh, for students that are particularly interested in traditional music. There's an intergenerational lifelong uh, learning element to this, engagement with and investment in place-based local culture in the community, okay with the development of a new infrastructure. The amount of work that we've done on the ground in the Western Isles uh, context, particularly in US, has resulted in 
partnerships that has even recently um, has um, resulted in development of a new building, a cultural hub, um, which is called Prop Solar in South Lewis. And that has been, um, that has been the result of quite a lot of partnership work. And so it's a partnership between the university and between the organisation, the first organisation, Fionnus. Uh, so, and we have a new resource with international reach integrated into Gallic medium education. And obviously, this kind of activity provides uh, institutional visibility as well at the university. <laughs> so, my third one here is Open Live. In a couple of weeks, um, I will be picking up to store it away on the, in the Outer Hebrides on the Isle of Lewis um, <coughs> to do this. And these are our last year's uh, students. They are on stage. Um, they're going. They're doing concerts, a whole bunch of concerts, um, and they are doing yes. In two weeks' time, there'll be twelve concerts from honors students. Physical. Uh, you'll be able to attend physically or join um, with online live streaming. So you're all welcome. Um, there are practical making workshops and talks which are open. They are open also to the public. Student creating and leading concerts and workshops and so students also are engaged in this. I've been very um, inspired to hear that quite a lot of the things that we are doing, people have been talking about it today, um, about um, as, as rich initiatives and approaches. So promotion of place and culture is a real impact through the integration also a relevant guest artists and local tradition fairness. Um, so that is an open life experience, I've decided. So I've added to your UHI uh, um, framework um, there. Um, so hybrid for inclusion and benchmarking educational values and practices. <laughs> he mentioned earlier on the learning and teaching enhancement strategy um, for a university and um, one of these uh, one of the commitments is the open access open education and another one which this residency that uh, will take place in Stornoway is highly relevant to and actually many of our residencies is the idea of authentic assessment and meaningful feedback and harnessing open education approaches. So, you know, we're not um, assessing our students in a, in a closed room. Uh, we're raising professional profile and um, we are looking at audience development for sustainability as well. So important for musicians. So some takeaways from my perspective. So uh, based on uh, what I've been sharing with you, uh, collaboration being a key feature of open education, and as musicians in our discipline, this is an authentic practice and a key feature of successful open approaches. Digital and community not being mutually exclusive, as you can see from those examples. We've been digitizing the community um, and, and humanizing the digital. Um, community as classroom uh, is an open approach which facilitates that collaboration and co-design and investment in communities. Um, so we, we really need to develop digital and community in all its forms in order for them to maximise on opportunity for cultural and educational sustainability. The next cohort of creators may come from these communities. Now, earlier on it was just mentioned, numbers is, uh, is, is a dirty word in capitalism, but it's important to us in, in the creative industries. You can see that the music industry contributes significantly to the UK economy. 5.8 billion uh, in 2019, up 11% from 5.2 in 2018. Employment in the industry hit an all time high in 2019. Okay, and then you've got there some figures from the Highlands and Islands Enterprise about the creative industries um, certificate. Um, so, 27% uh, growth in, within the sector between 2010 and 17. I'm sure that an update some of them I haven't been able to find it. Um, but I want to be able to, um, to close up by saying 
you know, as Chloe Dean brings to you a little bit later, about um, saying that, uh, you know, the, the applied music experience and the experience of being able to um, connect uh, to your, to be able to realise your own um, musical um, desires and um, whilst being in your own community is something that means that, you know, has a transformative impact um, on, on the region and on the individuals and on higher education. Um, we, we find that we are referred to by other institutions. We have benchmarked good practice in terms of um, that accessibility and the use of effective use of online um, and also engaging um, in um, the place-based approaches and also our international communities. Our students are very connected uh, to one another on the program. Um, I think maybe similarly, to, I think many of you feel very connected to each other, even though maybe you only see each other once a year. Um, but um, there might be a little bit of a parallel. But Chloe um, shared this without applied music, I would never have had the opportunity to engage with and learn from such a variety of inspirational people without having to leave my island. So Chloe lives up South Europe. This course enabled me to do what I love, be where I love, and to give back and develop the future community of the community I live and work in. Chloe is very, very active in her uh, local uh, community. So she's a Gaelic singer and piper. Um, um, yeah. So I, I hope that you can see from the examples that I've shared that um, that there is a degree of an open ethos in, in the kind of approaches that we have taken to develop um, our curriculum and our student experience in our community. A big part of it is being really very responsive to opportunity as well as and when they arrive and ma maintaining and developing partnerships um, in many different forums, partnerships. So, um, they're not just all partnerships with one local community and another local community, but you know, with the professional, um, professional areas. There are so many examples that I can share um, that would really deepen and exemplify uh, some of those claims. But um, it has this approach has gone some way to democratizing um, music education. You know, when you've got the likes of Chloe being able to reside in her own community. And it's something that we are very, very proud of um, having been able to achieve. So um, I think that's my last slide. Mm -hmm. Slide except join us in Stornoway at Atlanta uh, the week of the 17th of April. It is quite a program. So um, thank you very much. Uh, inspirational and uh, yeah, a real, a real example actually for colleagues of what, what we're trying to do, Chai, and what we do achieve. Uh, 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 put the lines to it, so thank you very much. Um, we've actually got plenty of time for questions. We've been trying, even though we've been a little bit late. So, um, are there any questions from the way? Yes. Thank you, Anamanda. That was incredibly inspiring. Um, as a I was a musician and as a, a PhD in music, I'm, I'm really inspired by this, but I'm also a manager at a university library. So I'm trying now to <clears throat> learn what I can take away from this and apply in a supporting role. So my question to you is, leaving my, the inspiration and the admiration apart, purely practical, what do you need from university? What is the- To make this work. Yeah, to make this work. What's well, the university's role here? Yeah. So, um, <laughs> um, I think there's two things here. I think, I think one of the things is you can all probably imagine just by looking at that. That's just three examples there are. There's over like 40 residencies that we've done. Um, it's a huge administrative experience 
which must not be just given to an administrator because it's deep administration and it is it requires a, an understanding that's quite deep of the, the music world you know um, so it's the management that's what you, that's what you need and i think also um i feel very grateful to the um, support that i've had from the learning and teaching academy here at your uh, child who have promoted and encouraged um, me to be able to share our uh, work um, at a variety of different forums and I just I think that, that there's, there's no end of opportunity to to be able to you know, uh, capture this you know um, it's, but that requires investment as well um, so I think the investment is to do with administration and um, uh, program leadership is a very important role for this degree. Sorry, it sounds like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm, I mean, the program leadership is important for every degree. Uh, you're dealing with, um, I mean, music is a very um, emotive area anyway. So um, you're, you're the pastoral element um, for uh, working with music students is also really significant as well. Um, so there's, there's just a lot of dimension and you've got to be uh, sensitive to all of that as well. Yeah. So it's complex. So thank you for asking that question because uh, I think it's important to also highlight that. Uh, Lorna had a question. Lorna. Thanks, that was a really inspiring presentation. And, um, we do that horrible thing of more accommodation than a question, but I'm from the Outer Hebrides, and I, I'm very typical, I think, of a particular demographic that had to leave the islands to, to continue education. Um, I left um, Stornoway in 1986 to Glasgow University, and I'm still in Glasgow, and I know that Aberdeen University, of probably about 20 years ago, did quite a bit of research um, into um, pathways from people who had left the islands to go into both further and higher education and of course they discovered that a lot of these people never went back. So it's really striking to me that you are enabling people to pursue further and higher education in their own community and I think that must be incredibly powerful for the islands um, and will hopefully prevent some of that brain drain from the community and um, so yeah I'm just it's really inspiring that you're doing with this for the music to me, but I'm wondering, are there other subject areas that you're seeing this similar model being um, being used uh, to enable people to stay on the islands to pursue their education? Definitely. Um, so, for instance, in Uist, you've got the degree in fine art. So, um, you've got, which is delivered again using a blend, um, and it's delivered across, it's networked. Uh, it's delivered across the university. Again, absolutely, it is enabling people to stay in, on the islands, but also, and this is very important as well, an inward attractor. Mm -hmm. um, and music has very much done that. Um, it's been an inward attractor. Um, one of the things that I also like to highlight as well, though at the same time, is that there's a, a slight tension with music as well, because Many of our musicians uh, are training up, and we've got a great roster of uh, of graduates. And I'm like very proud of them. you know they're appearing at top festivals all around the world, not just locally. But that mobility means that part of uh, the musical profile means that sometimes it might not be entirely practical for a few years to live on the island. But it's much more dense and complex than that because the thing is whether they're new to, they're a new Hebridean or whether they're originally from the Hebrides and wanting to stay there, wanting to be, be able to have a, a musical career, they, the, the music, the, the, the island and the, the, the place has got into their blood and into their, their soul. And you know, so people, absolutely new Hebrideans is, is one of the terms that people use. Um, who have stayed on the islands and moved as a result of the experience that they had on one of our music courses. So it, it's very, there's lots of nuances. It's quite a, a fascinating, um, the way that all these different connections you can, you can 
interview somebody, you can talk to somebody, and you, when you, once you've kind of broken it all down, you realise if they hadn't, you know, had a friendship through music that, with somebody that had told them about this weird, wacky course that was running, you know, they might not have been introduced. So we've had people that enrolled on applied music and they were living in Glasgow and they had never um, considered the Action Hebrides and then they moved there in third year. Another wonderful aspect, in case you're thinking of joining our degree program, um, <laughs> wonderful aspect of it is also you can do it from anywhere, but also that anywhere situation is quite dynamic. I mean, as a musician, traveling is enriching and you get to learn about other cultures. So maybe you go, okay, I'll do first year in the Antarctica, second year in Shetland, maybe amazing Shetland. For me, I'm a fiddler. I would love, so I would go to Shetland for a year. If I was doing applied music, I'd make my little menu up and I would, I would go roving, you know, for each year. That's what I would do. And uh, then I'd go to Glasgow, uh, maybe, or I might, uh, or I might choose somewhere else. And we have had quite some quite well known people on this course who are touring at the same time, so they're doing that anyway. And so we've had video conference joinings from Abu Dhabi Airport prayer room on uh, one uh, occasion. So um, yes. Uh, anyway, yes. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I was intrigued by the explanation of the University of St. Gall and what it talks about, you know, the cultural sort of differences and sensitivities. Did you find that both sides learned about the sensitivities? It wasn't just a one-day speech, was it? Or did both sides gain something about cultural sensitivity from each country? Yes, we think so. It was a really challenging yeah. um, collaboration um, because of uh, different degrees of of, the, of language. So what we did with that, which we made it even more challenging, of course, why not? Um, we took a Scottish folk tale in Scots, um, Tam Lynn, and we we sent that off uh, to the Senegalese, and they translated it into French, um, and then. They um, they then we were in we into lots of different pods. So there's different degrees of, of um, linguistic uh, communication. People were using different tools and, and things like Google Translate, and um, it was it, it was a, a fascinating process. But yes, I, I we got the feeling that um, you know people the students did, did become aware of. Of different sensitivities um, and of uh, what is the word I'm trying to think of? Uh, oh, the word's gone out of my head, but it's about um, it's not, kind of like stereotypes, but not quite. So, um, yes, and of course, we were doing as part of one of the modules music and culture, we we're doing a lot of focus on. You know, Cultural appropriation, um, Orientalism, things like this. So there was, it was very interesting to see how students suddenly realised uh, that there was uh, an opportunity for them to kind of consider and deepen their learning through that module too. Yeah. Thank you. Um, we'll take one more question. Then yes, no, not a question. Would you mind just popping the slide back to the join us? I would recommend like going to, to the Isle of Lewis in person. In the UK, um, because, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, um, unfortunately, John is usually there and the yeah. best host ever. Um, I'll be at the start of it, that's a bit early. That's a bit early. Um, yeah. <laughs> you like uh, but you never know, there might be some some, some early students, early arrivers. But it's, <laughs> there is, there's always good pop sessions, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's great. I always just feel like, 
I've been at my own wedding. You know, it's just like the most life affirming experience, a bit like a gas session. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I can't say is um, any phones that were too playing this up, um, up in islands or in other countries, or I think they are, do get in touch with us because we will uh, love to meet you, host you, and um, if John's there, he's the best host on the island. <laughs> Make sure you leave early for us to eat. So, yeah, I think that's probably us on time. So, I'm trying to unwind it once more. Like.